Madam President, members are working around the clock to finish the year on a strong note. Last, last week, this Senate, this week rather, wishful thinking, this week, the Senate will consider the bipartisan National Defense Authorization Bill, which I hope will send to the President's desk very soon. The NDAA has consistently been a bipartisan effort, and that's my expectation this year, too. On the nominations front, we're going to keep working as long as we can to confirm as many of the exceptional Biden nominees as possible. Since the start of the Biden administration, we have confirmed a total of 95, 95 judicial nominees to the bench, including one Supreme Court justice, 68 district judges, and 26, 26 circuit court judges. Let me say that again. Over the past two years, we've confirmed 95 new judges to the bench, including 26 court, circuit court judges, surpassing the first two years of the past two administrations. Today, we'll confirm number 96 when we vote on Tamika Montgomery Reeves to serve as circuit judge on the Third Circuit. An alumnus of the University of Mississippi and Georgia Law School, Judge Montgomery Reeves served as a clerk in Delaware before embarking on a successful career in private practice. In 2005, she was appointed to the Delaware Court of Chancery and then to the State Supreme Court in 2020, becoming the first black woman to ever serve in either court. When confirmed, Judge Montgomery Reeves will join the proud company of so many of the Biden appointees who are, little by little, reshaping our courts for the better. Of the 95 judges we've confirmed so to date, 71 are women, 75 percent. 65 are people of color, almost 70 percent. 45 are women of color, nearly 50 percent. And 23 are black women, nearly 25 percent. We've never seen a class of new judges that brings so much diversity, variety, and dynamism in a single two-year stretch. And of course, it's not just the diversity of, the, of demography that matters. In the last two years, the Senate's confirmed more civil rights lawyers, public defenders, election attorneys, immigration lawyers than we typically see in this chamber. It's a big reason today why our courts are more balanced and more dynamic and more experienced than they were two years ago. You can be sure, Madam President, that judges will remain a top priority in the Congress to come. More judges mean a more balanced judiciary, and a more balanced judiciary will mean greater trust in our courts in the long run, so important for our country at this moment in time, because the MAGA Supreme Court and so many of these other MAGA judges have caused people to lose faith in the courts. On the Omni. As we keep working on confirming more judges and advancing the defense authorization bill, both sides also continue not negotiating a deal for a year-long omnibus. Over the weekend, appropriators held positive and productive conversations, enough that both sides are moving forward in good faith to reach a deal, even if it's not going to be everything both sides want. Later this week, members should be prepared to take quick action on a CR, a one-week CR, so we can give appropriators more time to finish a full funding bill before the holidays. I'm optimistic we could take action on a CR rather quickly and avoid the shutdown that neither side wants, and that is a one-week CR. The benefits of an omnibus are as many as the number of citizens in America. All of us are better off when the government is fully equipped to provide vital services millions rely on. One group who very much needs an omnibus are our veterans. Last week, the VA wrote Congress a letter warning that a CR would mean a $10 billion shortfall for the VA. That means fewer health care workers on the job. It would mean a surge in the backlog of claims. And God forbid it would throw a wrench in the VA's plan to implement something we were all so proud that we passed on a bipartisan basis this summer, the PACT Act. There is no reason we need to go down this road. The brave Americans who have served our country in uniform should never have to suffer the consequences of failing to fund the government. But unfortunately, that's the risk they face as of right now if we don't finish the job. So to all my colleagues, let's continue negotiations in good faith. Both sides are going to have to give in order to get it done. But it'll be worth it if it means doing right by our veterans, our service members in uniforms, our kids, their families. That's what's at stake here in this process.
to fund the government. Finally, on anti-Semitism. Earlier today, I had the honor of addressing a gathering org or organized by the Orthodox Union in New York to address the dangers, the serious dangers of rising anti-Semitism. Over the past two months, American Jews have watched in horror as numerous public figures, from entertainers all the way to former President Trump, have fanned the flames, uh, have fanned the flames and of anti-Semitism through their words and conduct. It's a sad reminder that after decades of hard-won progress, unfortunately, sadly, anti-Semitism is on resurgence here in America. We see anti-Semitism not only through slurs and graffiti and, and graffiti and threats, all of which are abhorrent and unacceptable, but also physical violence against our Jewish brothers and sisters, sometimes tragically deadly. Poway, Jersey City, Muncie, Pittsburgh, and not to mention the weekly attacks against synagogues and schools and Jewish communities that never reach the spotlight. All, American, all, all Americans Jew, Jews know and remember these names. They are seared in our memory. And unless we can come together as a community and as a country to address this crisis, I fear we'll soon have to add more names to the list. Of course, I have personal experience about this kind of anti-Semitism in terms of my family. My great-grandparents lived in a place in western Ukraine. They had, eight, they had 18 children believing devoutly in the Bible and God's first command to man, which was be fruitful and multiply. My grandfather was one of three of those 18 who came to America, but the other 15 stayed there. And when the Nazis came into western Ukraine, they told my great-grandmother to gather her entire, he, her husband had been a well-known Jewish scholar. They told my great, he had passed away, and they told my great-grandmother to gather her larger family on the porch. Thirty-five people gathered on the porch from ages 85 to four months. The Nazis said, come with us. She was a tough lady. She said, we're not moving, and they machine-gunned every one of them down. These are the stakes, Madam President. When the former president of the United States welcomes at his own dinner table several vicious anti-Semites, and then rather than apologize, he lectures American Jewish leaders for insufficient loyalty, it is incumbent on all of us to speak out. I'm proud of many Jewish organizations that did speak out, some of them former strong, strong allies of the former president. It's made a big difference. Now, of course, America's roots of democracy are far deeper than those that existed in Europe. But the lesson of history is we must speak out against bigotry of all types, or it grows. Its evil seed grows. I shudder, I shudder to think of what it would mean for the safety of our children, their children, and their children after that, if the ideology elevated by the former president were to continue to seep into our society like a poison. Every single one of us, without exception, has an obligation to call out the poison of anti-Semitism and all other bigotries, wherever they arise, to tolerate them and let them grow, and let, let them grow, risk, risk horrors that we have seen in the past and on the globe, and we don't want to see in the future. I yield the floor.